I hope you have done your quiz well. Uh, we will look at the quiz later if you want. Any problems that you had in your quizzes, previous quizzes, you, you put something and you think you are right, but it says that not, then we could discuss it in the class. Sometimes I do mistake, so I make mistake, mistake and I don't put the right answer for the when, when, write, when entering, when writing. So please tell me if you find anything that you think it is not correct. Okay, so we talked about uh, these seven great ideas. Uh, and the first one, which maybe is the basic of all of the ideas, is abstraction. Is making, is keeping the details in the lower levels. And when we are coming to the upper levels, then we have some kind of big picture, not all the details. The, the same thing is, is happening in your program. When you write the program, usually you have, you start from an application software. For example, you are writing a word processing application. You are writing a website, a, data, a website with a database. Whatever program that you are working on, you have an application software. And usually you are writing that in high level language, like C, Python, uh, Java, in high level languages. In high level languages, you don't go to the detail of what, how machine is working. Then the system software takes the, uh, your, takes your application and tries to do something on that. The first thing would be compiler. So uh, compiler gets your application and compile it to a binary code, a machine code. And this is the code that the computer could execute. The computer doesn't understand your, for example, your C codes, your C programming. But it will be compiled to a machine language, to a machine code. And then, after it has been compiled and the machine, language, the machine code is ready, then the operating system is coming to work. It gets the program and tries to allocate memory for that, schedule the execution of the task, and so many things that operating system does. For example, what kind of input and output you need in your program, uh, memory, uh, scheduling tasks. These things will be done, will be performed by operating system. So you see, you don't go through the hassle of, for example, compiling, writing machine code, through the hassle of talking with the computer, how it works. Everything will be done by different software, different applications, like a compiler, like operating system, and then at the bottom would be the hardware, the machine which executes your code. Again, you see here, again, we have some kind of uh, abstraction, application, system, and then hardware. And the abstraction works everywhere. And the hardware has processor, memory, I.O. control. This idea is going to be repeated throughout the book that we have, we use these seven ideas when we are uh, building or designing uh, the machine. I cannot emphasize more again on reading the book. You see, as we here, we have uh, the, the section of the book which this slide is related to. So this is 1.3. You know, for this, you should write, you should read 1.3. Okay, what I've told you, you write a program in high-level language. Maybe it's good if I change the color to the... You write in C, Java, and if, for example, here we have a module called swap, and you have temp equal to something, and something equal to the other one, and then that one equal to time temp. When you want to swap two things, you put it in a temporary place, and then you swap. So you write this code. Then it goes for compiler. Compiler 
translates this, co this code to a machine code. To, or, or even we can say to a, 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 the first step would be assembly language. Assembly language is a language that it is text-based. So it is not zero, one, zero, one. It is text-based, but it is close to the machine. So machine actually is using this instruction, but in this form. So assembly language is a low-level language. It is like machine code, but in text. For example, it, as you could see, we have a, a, a command called multiply, add, load, store, and so on. So the compiler gets your code, converts it to assembly, and then go from assembly, it is easy to make a machine code, which would be zero and one. These zero and ones will be given to operating system. Now operating system, it has control over the hardware, knows which memory is uh, available and which memory is not available, where we should put this code there, and then how to schedule it for being executed and so on. So high level language, so it is a level of abstraction close to your idea, your application at top level. And even in your application writing, you use some kind of abstraction. First, you start with the top level modules and then going down in detail, more detail, more detail. And then we have assembly language, some kind of textual presentation of the instructions. These are the instructions of the machine, machine code, but textual, you see. ADD, add, LW, load word, for example. And then we have hardware representation, which will be binary and digit zero and ones that we used. So these are uh, the encoded instructions which is given to the machine. And then machine starts to fetch these instructions, then decode it. So what is this? For example, this is load word something. So decode it and then execute it. And then again, the next instruction. Fetch, decode, execute. The next instruction, fetch, decode, execute. So in, in a computer, whatever, what, whatever class is that? Is it uh, embedded, server, personal, whatever it is, the computer has five main components. I, I am sure that you are familiar with that. Five main components. If I want to name it first and then we go through the one, then, uh, the one by one, the first one which be a processor which consists of two things, control pass and data pass. Data pass for calculating, for uh, making arithmetic operations, logic operations, and control pass to control the uh, the instructions, which one should be do what, and so on. We will talk about this in detail in our course. Actually, our course is that, to design this, to design control pass and data pass for a processor. The next one would be input. So the computer needs input. It gets data from the outside world of the computer. The next one would be output, so it will generate data for the out, outside, outside world. And the other one is memory. So the, for working, the computer needs some kind of place to store information there. The information could be either code, which executes, or data which will be, for example, analyzed or uh, processed and so on. So we have five main components. Input, output, memory, control, and data, which together would be the processor. We have five main components. Same components for all kinds. Either it is a mobile, uh, it is a server, whatever it is, the same thing. Uh, they have input output. So, for example, the user interface. I am using right now this mouse. I am using this touch uh, device. They are all as an input. 
Then we have a storage devices to store information. Hard disk, these are also input and output. So it, for example, hard disk is input and also output because you read data from hard disk, you store a file in the hard disk, to the hard disk. And also we have network adapters. Nowadays, everything is connected and everything the mobile also, the smartphone, the desktop, anything would be connected. So the network now is a very important input output in the computer. Maybe 30 years ago it was not like that. <coughs> we weren't talking about network, but now network is very important. These are the things that uh, uh, computer uh, forms a computer. So let's see one of the, some of them by example. For example, the first one would be the display, which is an, is an output display. Display, for example, this one. That one, no, that one not, it is not LCD. This is a projector, projecting device. But this one is an LCD. This one is LCD. What you have in front of you are LCD. So the, in LCD, we have uh, a display a rectangle display which consists of points. These points, we are, we are calling them pixels. Pixels, picture elements, for example, pixels. So these pixels, it, it depends on the resolution of the LCD. For example, the resolution of this LCD is 920 by 1080, for example. 1920 by 1080 which means it has uh, 1,920 pixels in uh, horizontal part and 1,080 uh, uh, rows, which every uh, out of them. So these are the number of pixels of this LCD. But how do we see that? It is not like that, that the, all of the pixels 1920 times 1080 pixels, which would be around how much? Uh, 4, 4, 4, 4K, yeah? Yeah, around 4K. Yes. No, 4K, no. Uh, how much is it? No, two, let's say this is 2K, this is 1K, around 2 meg. 2 meg pixels. It is not that all of them are turned out, are turned on at the same time. But we have some kind of raster scan. Raster scan means that in every moment, one of them is turned on or off. It depends on that. It, is, it should be, for example, on and giving us a color of, for example, yellow, white, red or it is off so it doesn't it doesn't uh, generate anything and it is a black pixel so in every moment one of them is just on or off it with, with its color with corresponding color and then it will be scanned during the time so it is a raster scan usually they start from top left the first pixel would be this, then the next one, the next one, the next one, go at the, the row, and then again from the next one, the, the next uh, row, and so on. So in every moment, one of them is on. And at, for that one, we are using some kind of, for example, either it is active display or it is a passive one. For passive one, uh, we are using some kind of a capacitor to, uh, um, to make the light go through that or stops and doesn't go through that. For active, we are using transistors to make the light pass or not. So if, for example, this, this pixel, this is a pixel here, which is blue at the corner of the T, capital T. This is a pixel which should be blue. So when the raster scan reaches that point, it will see that it should be blue. Then the transistors pass the light 
somehow that we see it as a blue. For example, it has three, three light sources, red, green, blue, and with the combination of R and G, B and B, we see the color of that. For example, for blue, the red and green would be nothing, they don't pass, but the blue passes and then we see it's blue, and other colors that you see. So during the scan, how, how does it work? It looks at a frame buffer. So when it reaches this point, what, what, should, it be, what should it be? What, what color would it be? It is here. For example, this point at x, x0 and y0, we have, uh, let's say, three 8-bit numbers. One of them corresponds to red, one of them corresponds to G, one of them corresponds to B. There is three bytes here at this position in frame buffer. The raster scan reads it, see what, is the, what, what are the values. Then the transistor passes the light for that pixel, then goes to the next pixel. I start here, then the next one, then the next one, and it goes for the scans the whole display. But why we see it like that? We see that everything is on. How? Why is that? We cannot see it. This is this is they are turning on one by one, one by one. We see the whole thing. Why? Anybody? Yes. The human brain cannot comprehend the flickering of the light, so it just blends everything together. Every, every, perfect, yes. And it should be very fast. I guess the human eye could uh, distinguish something, uh, uh, something greater than 1 over 50 seconds. 1 over 50 is uh, 20 milliseconds. So if the display, if the image changes in less than 20 milliseconds, we cannot understand, we cannot notice. We, we, we see that it is the same. So it, the whole scan is done in less than 20 milliseconds. So we, we see it, it is always very good. And, and uh, depending on the resolution, depending on the refresh rate of the display, the number of scans, the number of pixels, and the speed of the scan differs. So it depends on the number. Now this is one of the output devices which we will work that, with that in with computers and and now everything has a LCD and very very good LCDs actually active display LCDs with high resolution even your smartphone might be uh, 20, 2000 by 2000 or like that. I don't know. Look at your uh, smartphone description, a specification is what is the display. The next thing, as an example, as input, touch screen. So, for example, this is a touch screen, the, the one that I have here. I can, you see, I can use my hand and write on that. It's a touch screen. But I am not sure. It, is it no, it seems not. Is it multi-touch or just one touch? It seems that it is single touch. But for example, your smartphone supports multi-touch, and even some of them support 10, 10 uh, touch at the same time. You could have so many gestures we could, you could use in your uh, mobile device. But here, I guess it is a single touch. And let me, how could I erase it? It was here. Ah. Uh, again, this is some kind of uh, input device, and usually they are post PC device. After, before that, we had keyboard and mouse. We using these as a, as our input main input device that we were using to talk with your, our computer. But now it supersedes keyboard and mouse. They are two kinds: resistive and capacitive. So because the, the hand has some kind of it, uh, both resistors and also capacitors, so it, ha it has some kind of electric charge. So we can use it 
to find out where we have put our finger, and then based on that, they will do something on that. So the capacitive, nowadays we are using mainly capacitive types, not the resistors. And the capacitive uh, supports multi-touch, but the resistors, they don't support multi-touch. Most tablets, smartphones, they are, they are using capacitive and multiple touch simultaneously. So this is the other thing that we saw as an input device. The next thing that we would like to see is if we go to the box. So this is a device, a post-PC era device, and you have, you, all, all of you have that. This is an Apple iPhone, which you could see here. Uh, here is the LCD display. This is the frame. This is the battery. This is the main board. The main board is this, and the other things, camera, uh, memory, so the other things, microphone. So if you look at the main board, in the main board, you could see there is a processor, A12 Apple processor. They designed this processor, which we will see it now. And also there are other things on the board, for example, this is battery charger, this is audio amplifier, this is power management, IC, the other one, for example, yes, a power management, power management, this is a micro, four gigam. This is SDRAM here, they have SDRAM, Apple Micron MT, four gigabyte mobile SDRAM. They have SDRAM also on the board, and these are the things that you could see on the board. So again, you saw, we, sh we show you uh, output, input. Now we are going to see processor, and memory also is there. Inside the processor, as I've told you, there are two main components, data pass and control pass. Data pass operations are done by that, and control sequences. For example, the control pass, after fetching the instruction and decoding, we see it is a load. If it is a load, then it means that we have to go to the memory and find the address, and then get a data from memory, and then bring it to computer, and then store it in a register. You do the processor and strategies. So these things are controlled and sequenced by the control pass. But the data pass, for example, you get this data, you have to add it to something. The data pass added, adds and other operations. Uh, we have inside the processor cache memory. I, we have talked about cache last time in the seven great ideas. One of them was memory hierarchy, that you will use a fast, small memory close to the CPU, to the processor, but your main memory would be something large and slow, and it will be outside of the memory of it. So a small, fast SRAM, a static RAM, compared to what? To DRAM, dynamic RAM. Dynamic RAMs are dense, so we have a big storage by dynamic RAM, but they are slow. Static RAMs are not dense, so we cannot have a, a big memory of SRAM, but they are fast. So we use some kind of memory hierarchy for bo using both of them. There was a processor there, and this is the processor. So you see, we came from top to going down, 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 more detail. I guess we will stop here. Uh, and we, you see, this, is, this was the, this was the, this was the mobile phone, and on that there was a board. In board there was a processor, and the processor is this. Inside the processor, you see that we have a logic for accessing the uh, DDR, double data DRAM, to, 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 to touch with the DRAM. We have, for example, the cache here. We have, as, told, as I told you, fast SRAM memory. 
We have GPU graphical processing unit. We have a core, a big core. The core, the core of the CPU, which consists of data pass and control pass. Here we have NPU neural processing units. Uh, so this, this is the design of A12, which you could see here. So this is an IC. This is an IC, maybe the size of less than two centimeter by two centimeter. I am not sure about the, the, the size. We didn't we write? No, I didn't write the size of that. It is very a small size. I, I guess it would be less than one centimeter. One centimeter by one centimeter, maybe. And uh, because it, it goes to the Apple iPhone, then it cannot be bigger than that. So this is an IC, and during that IC, there are more than maybe uh, 200 million transistors, which forms these things, the logic, the cache, the GPU, the core, the CPU core, and so on. <clears throat> so as you saw, the abstraction could help us to deal with complexity. Higher, in, in higher levels, we have low detail, we have the idea, and then we go one by one to the more detail, to the lower levels of instruction. We have talked about abstraction and hierarchy in hardware. We also have talked about abstraction in software, your application, system software, and then hardware. There should be a, some kind of glue, some kind of interface between these two sides, hardware and software. Software with all of the uh, abstraction levels it has, and hardware with all of the abstraction levels. Abstraction levels. And these inter this interface is nothing but ISA, Instruction Set Architecture. The Instruction Set Architectures is some kind of a, a interface between hardware and software. We use, we write software, this will act as a vocabulary, so when you write something, then it is, acts at like a vocabulary, then brings a meaning of that which hardware could understand. The hardware software interface. At the, so we started from the software at the higher level, then we have a software level as application binary interface. The designers tried to make application binary interfaces so if you wrote some program, then you don't need to change it for another hardware. So we have application, we have hardware. There is a application binary interface which gets your application, which consists, it has a compiler, it has some kind of uh, uh, APIs, and then it will give it to the hardware. So again, they, it will uh, help you not to think about the hardware, just concentrate on the software. The instruction set architecture, they know the instruction set architecture in uh, application binary interface, and then they go to the implementation to the hardware. So implementation is hardware. Application is high-level software. Between is instruction set and application binary interface. And this is the instruction which uh, software, <laughs> this is a slide uh, generated by hardware people. They are saying the hot software people, they are dancing, they are laughing, they are enjoying everything, and but the hardware people, they are making uh, the, the load, so they do the hard work. Uh, I guess you have seen this in the video by Hennessy and Peterson that uh, early mainframes didn't have ISA and then the IBM started to introduce the concept of instruction sets and that instruction set used for different processor designs. So one, one program, one 
set of instructions goes to different prog- different uh, hardware. And uh, besides IBM, also Intel has a kind of instruction set which try to um, to uh, keep it down compatible during the generation. It says that in the book you could see. In some point, they thought that, okay, this instruction set is very old. We have to change it. We have to redesign the instructions. But it was not successful. One of the main points of, uh, of Intel and being successful during the whole year, the, these years was, was that one. They, they kept back compatibility. So if you have a very old program working in DOS, you, do you know DOS? I don't think so. Do you, do you know what is DOS? No. DOS is disk operating system. Microsoft, when it started in 1983, I guess, Bill Gates, they, they gave, uh, the, the first operating system they had was DOS. And then they uh, went to Windows, and then Windows uh, 3, Windows uh, 7, and then so on. So DOS, at, so you, if you have some kind of programs working in DOS, it uh, still could run on the machine. And uh, so they, they tried it, but it didn't. Uh, they talked about this in the video, oh, very good, so, Dr. Hennessy and Dr. Peters. So we talked about input, output, hardware, uh, processor. We need some place to store data and a safe place. What, I do, what do I mean by safe place? Because in computer, in, in a smartphone, in computer, we have main memories. And as I've told you, the main memories are DRAM, dynamic RAMs. So they lose, when, when, when the power is lost, they lose everything. So the DRAM doesn't keep the data. Whenever you turn it off, it's, it's gone. The DRAM is gone. So we need some kind of non-volatile memory. They are volatile. We need a non-volatile memory. <coughs> The volatile main memory is there, and we need that because the processor needs something to work with that, but it loses data. We need to have a secondary memory, not the main memory. The main memory is the primary memory. The secondary memory, we need the secondary memory. And what would be that? The secondary memory. What do you suggest to keep the data there? A hard disk? Hard disk, perfect. Hard disk. We are keeping our, for example, programs in hard disk. You write a C program, a store it in hard disk, and then when you want to run it, you uh, ask, for example, the Visual C uh, program to bring it, to compile it, and then give it, gives it to the operating system and, uh, and executes that. So we will store that in hard disk. What do we have here? We don't have hard disk here. What do we have for safe place to store? And then flash? Flash, yeah. The flash here, which, for example, you see, you, it says that the internal memory, when you buy your smartphone, the internal memory is 2 gig, and it has 32 gig of flash, of data, of memory. So the flash memory is the safe place to store. It doesn't lose the data. It is non-volatile. But there is a main memory also inside. So non-volatile memory is the magnetic disk, hard disk, like this one. Uh, flash memory in uh, smartphones. Uh, CD-ROM, DVD that we were using, it's, it's going to be uh, disappear soon. These, are, these were the storage, the secondary storage that we found. What do we have else? Networks. As I told you, it is very important now. It was not like that before. So we need it for three things. One of them is communication. We want to connect computers to touch. I'm now using internet. Uh, you are using the brighter space, so, every, so, so many things. The other one is resource sharing. Uh, I am, uh, I, I am. For example, I have a OneDrive here, 
that I am using for storing my uh, files, some kind of resource sharing. The hard disk, the storage would be in another computer in servers of the university. I guess you all of all of you have OneDrive, yeah, in, in university. Yeah. So it's somewhere so we could do the resource sharing. And the next thing is no non local access. Sometimes you want to use the processing power of something else. As I've told you, like a cloud computing software as a service. So you need a non-local access. For these three reasons now, we have network. And it is some kind of a necessary element in, in our computers right now. And it could be a local area network that we can we just connect it to each other, or it would be a wide area network which would be internet, and so we are all connected together. It could be based on wireless network or either cable network, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on. So these are the networks that now we are using in our computers. Uh, so this one, for example, has Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. Uh, NFC and these that these communication techniques. We have talked a lot about uh, the component of process, uh, the computers, and what would be. They are all based on technology. As you see, the, the name of the chapter is computer abstractions and technology. And they are all due to technology, because technology has uh, grown, it has been grown, and they made us so many things. Well, let's have a look of technology. Uh, this technology is the one that building processors, building memory, building uh, input-output devices, and so on, and it continues to grow. Uh, during the time, during the last 40, 50 years, the performance and the capacity has been increased. I've told you, more uh, predicted that every uh, half and uh, one and a half year, the capacity of the, uh, transistor, the number of transistors is doubled. Now it is not correct, it is slowed down a little. But it was true for almost 40 years. And so the, the density, the capacity has been. And the cost is all, uh, reducing, because the new technology has less uh, parts, uh, has a better learning curve. And so we have uh, reduced cost. At, if you look at this table, very simple table, 1951, we had vacuum tube the tubes that will uh, making the switches. If you uh, put uh, power on that, it was switching. If not, it does. it's some kind of a relay, vacuum tube. You, you haven't seen vacuum tube. I, I've seen. I, I had uh, a TV with vacuum tube in my home at that time. So they needed to warm up to a start. We had to turn it on after two minutes. They warmed up, and then they, the TV was working. But then transistor came. After transistor, it, it, it started the semiconductor era. So everything is now semiconductor. And uh, there is a, a relative performance per cost. Cost performance, if we assume that vacuum tube is one, then the transistors were 35. Then we, we were able to put transistors together and make a very uh, integrate, uh, integrated circuits consisting of, let's say, th uh, thousand transistors. So this was the era of IC, integrated circuits. Then we, the technology improved. And we had very large scale IC more than million transistors in an IC. IC like, as I told you, two centimeter by two centimeter. At that 
area, you put more than a million transistors. And now it is more than 300 million transistors in a, in a single chip, in a single IC, integrated circuit. Uh, and you see <laughs> the, uh, the relative performance is 250 billion compared to uh, vacuum, vacuum tube. 1951 to 2030, it is 50, 62 years. In 62 years, you see the cost performance has 250 billion times growth, growth 250 million times. And this is a, uh, this is the capacity of uh, memory chips. Uh, in 1976, we had chips around uh, 2K memory, 2K bit memory. And then as you could see, we have a, some kind of a slope of doubling every two years, every one and a half year. Uh, and then uh, here it is a little but degraded and then again and now it is not doubling every half one and a half year. It, they say that it is now doubling every three years, every four years even. So for example, in 2000 BIS, in 2020, uh, let me erase that to see what's that there. Is it 16? Let me see. Is it? 16 gig. Here we had 2K, here we have 16 gig. How many times? 2K meg is 1000, gig is million, 2 to 6 is 8. So 8 million times in how many years? In 40 years, 43 years, 44 years. This is the prediction of more, uh, and uh, you see how technology has improved. So let's talk a little. I am not going to detail, and I am not going to ask of this in the exam, but just to give you an idea. It's good to have some kind of idea about the semiconductor technology. Uh, so everything is semiconductor now. Everything is there. We are moving towards quantum computing, which would, could be a competitor for semiconductor, but it takes time. It's not commercialized yet. Maybe it comes and it has some kind of pro promising ideas there, but we are not there yet. Still, we have semiconductor. Semiconductor industry is based on silicon. Silicon is a material not conductive, very good, not insulating, a complete insulator. It's in between. We can add materials to the silicon, impurities to silicon, to make a design, to make a circuit. And these materials are either conductors, like uh, Cooper, either Insulators like SiO2, uh, silicon oxide, which is a, a very good, like uh, glass. Glass is SiO2. It is an uh, insulator. And the main part is the switch part. We can add materials to the silicon, which is based again on, based on silicon impurity. That could either conduct and not conduct. So these are switches. We can control them. Conduct, no conduct, don't conduct. So these are the three things that we will put on our silicon. We have a silicon, we will put that there. Uh, let's, let's see this video fast. This is made by Intel. How could I? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's 
starting from sand, silicon sand. Wafers. Now we are putting materials. Insulators, conductors, or switch. This is inside. Each one of the materials are there. And even we will make it a 3D layering. Then we will cut them. This is a die, a chip, an IC, which is one by one centimeter. And we will put it on the uh, packaging part, and the pins are connected, and then it goes. So this is the process of uh, manufacturing IC. As you could see, we get uh, silicon uh, sand from sand, uh, slice it, make it wafers, going to out of 40 processing steps, putting impurity, insulators, metals on that. Uh, then uh, we have the dyes, it's patterns, each, each each square is something that we put our design on that. Then we test it. There should be some kind of defect there for sure. When we do something, then it is not perfect. So we would have defects. So we uh, put them out, the defected ones. Then we have the dicer. So the dies are generated. And again, in dye, some of them might be defected, so we have to remove them, and the other one would be good. Then they go for the packaging, and in the packaging, again, it's tested, and if, again, we find some defected uh, package, defended IC, we will throw it out, and then it's gone. So you see, during the process, there are lots of parts. So we will use, uh, we will lose uh, those devices, and the last thing that coming out is what they sell and they generate it. We call this yield. The yield is the proportion of working dyes per wafer. So if the whatever yield is closer to one, it is, it is better. So we've had a hundred percent yield. But when it comes down to 90%, 80%, it's a defected process. During the times, so it, this process started 19, uh, when transistor started, it's at that time, so it has been improved. And during the learning curve, we will have less and less defected uh, areas. But again, it is still there. They, with this process, what we build is some kind of transistors. And with the transistors, we are building gates. And with the gates, we are building registers. And with the register transfer, at that register level, I've showed you that slide before, we are building our system. So starting from silicon, transistor, gates, <laughs> registers, and then the system. For example, this is a gate, an inverter gate. In inverter gate, you know, inverter is when you put 
uh, one here, you, go, you get zero here. When you put zero here, you get one. And it has been implemented using two uh, transistors, one NMOS, one PMOS. You haven't uh, seen that, y yes? I I have you seen in any courses? No, so don't worry about it. I was just want to give you some pictures not uh, necessary in the material of the course. So we have transistors. For example, this one is a PMOS transistor. This one is an NMOS transistor. In the next slide, I will show you how to make NMOS and PMOS transistor, which is the building, building cells of everything now in industry. This, this is CMOS system, CMOS, complementary MOS, have uh, PMOS and NMOS together. Uh, imp so input one, input one, will switch, will turn this transistor on. So if this transistor on, then the ground would be connected here and it will be zero. And input zero will make this transistor on because it is a PMOS and there is a voltage between, uh, uh, between source and gate. So this will be on. And so VDD is connected here and would be one. So if you put if you put one, you get zero. If you put zero, you get one. This is a basic inverter which with this uh, equation. This is a NMOS transistor. Again, I told you we have silicon. In silicon, we are adding some impurities. The impurities would be either P or N. When we say we say P, it means that it has uh, positive uh, positive charges. In negative, we have negative charges, which is electron. Electron is negative. Positive is hole. When there is no electron, then it means positive. It is a hole, not no no electron there. So in, in that substrate, we have implemented uh, two N uh, impurity. So it means that they have electrons here, so we can, we can manage them. They are semiconductor. So they can conduct, they can not conduct. And here we have another polysilicon with uh, insulator SiO2 so what happens this is a uh, this is a uh, nmos it is the drain this is the source and this is the gate we try to make the transistor to switch the transistor using gate and source and then the current will be coming out or in by drain so what do we do here? For example, for this one, we put a positive uh, voltage between uh, source and gate. When you put the positive charge there, the positive voltage there, then the electrons coming, the positive uh, uh, attracts the electrons. The electron is coming to the positive uh, charge. So electrons are coming there, and we have a lot of electrons, available electrons there. When you have you have electrons somewhere, it means that it conducts. If you have a, a electrical field, it 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 will generate the current, and it means that conducting. If you don't have electronics, electrons or holes then you don't have the current. It is that not conducting insulators. So when coming here, the electrons, you have generated a virtual channel. You could generate this channel. The beauty is here that you, with voltage, you made a channel, and this channel makes this channel uh, 
conducting, and it means that the transistor is on at this stage, and so it is a switch. You, you put something there, and it turned on. And with that, you build everything. I show you how to build inverter, and from the inverter, you build AND, NAND, OR, AND, going up to flip-flops, registers, and so on. The same thing is almost about the PMOS, which I don't go through the details. I am sure that you don't like it, but I wanted to give you an idea of what is happening inside the silicon. So the transistor, uh, they have capacitors, resistors. They are not ideal. We have, we liked it to be ideal. It means no resistor when it is on, no capacitor when it is on, just a, like a metal, a copper, but it is not like that. When you turn it on, there are electrons there, but they are not perfect conductors. So we have resistors, we have capacitors, and I don't go through the detail of that. And these uh, resistors and these capacitors uh, related to L and the, uh, W. W is the width of the channel, and L is the length of the poly here. This is an example of a wafer where we have built uh, Intel Core 10th generation on that. If you look at this wafer, this is a wafer of uh, 300 millimeter. It means that the diameter is 330 centimeter, 12 inch. So the diameter is 12 inch, and uh, there are 506 chips on that with 10 nanometer technology. 10 nanometer technology means uh, the resolution that you can build in your chip. This, let me show you. This is W. This is 10 nanometer in this technology. When, when the technology improves, it goes down. Now I guess we have 3 nanometer technology. At maybe 30 years ago, we had 200 micron technology. So the technology that the the chips is getting uh, smaller, the technology will be better, so we can put uh, channels and uh, silicons, uh, impurities closer to each other, and this will make more capacity. So it is a 10 nanometer technology, and each chip is 11 by 10 millimeter, one by one almost one by one centimeter, each chip. Since we are going to talk a little about performance, we go a little about cost, and then we go for performance. Because everything has cost. As I've told you, you are not living in a world with unlimited resources and could spend whatever you want on that. There is a cost for everything and you should consider that in your design. Uh, this is some kind of a practical uh, equation, not a mathematical that we have calculated. They are saying that the yield, the number of transistors, the working, trans the working uh, dies that you get out of the process, the whole process, is this. 1 over 1 plus defects per area, area depends again on technology. So if it depends on technology. They are, they are almost close to 1. They are almost close to 1. This is very important. It says whatever the die area, for example, the die area for the Intel was 11 times 10 millimeter. Whatever the area is, make it to the power of two, and it yield is related to that. So if you build a chip two times in length, then the area is four times, and then the yield is 16 times, uh, one to 16 times, and this yield is this the main thing 
that will make the cost because cost is the wafer plus some kind of uh, uh, process that we are doing. They are almost constant. Uh, then the number of dyes that you get defines the cost of per IC. So you see, this will show you that the area of dye is very important. Again, I tell you that you are not living in a world with unlimited resources. You should make your area as less as possible to make it cheaper. Nonlinear relation to area and defect rates and uh, wafer cost and area are fixed. You get wafers. Uh, fixed means sometimes it's changed because the technology changed. But when you go to cut the wafer, cut the sand, these things are very, but almost fixed compared to that. Defect rate determined by manufacturing process. And the dye area determined by architecture. The, the, the number of transistors that you want to put on that area, so it will define the area. OK, I guess if we can stop here. OK. Uh, we have reached 1.6. I ask you again and emphasize that you read the chapters of the book. Now we have 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, and 1, 5. We have covered up to 1, 5. Please read the book. Uh, they are, uh, the book is written by two main uh, scholars in this area, so it is good if you read it. They are much, much better than me, so read that book. Okay, anything? Any comments? Yes, please. Post record? Yes. The lectures? They are all in the site. Yeah, they are all in the site. If, if, for example, I forgot to put the last lecture in the site until maybe yesterday night, evening, I, I remember I put it. Just give me, uh, remind me if I forgot, because I could put it for you. Thanks to the uh, technology of University of Ottawa.